work I'm going to be talking about is um, text and human experiences and Kenneth Slessor's poetry, how it responds to that particular module, the idea of um, human experiences. And I'll be focusing on that idea, on how um, human experience, I think how we can interpret it in relation to Slessor's poetry. And also, I think really importantly, the kinds of techniques that Slessor uses to, to do this. So we're not just looking at the question of theme, we're also thinking about what is specifically poetic about his response to and his expression of the idea of human experience. So I'll just go to my first slide. So I'm just going to give you a, a list of some of the um, forms of human experience I think we can identify in the set poems of Slessor for the HSC. So first one I'm going to identify for you is what I would call existential being. He's clearly a poet who is very interested in existential questions and by that I mean really fundamental questions of human being within, for instance, time the idea of time being an element within which we as humans exist and that shapes our experience of, of ourselves. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk about out of time and beach burial in relation to that particular approach. Um, existential experience. Now here, the sorts of issues that um, existential philosophers are very interested in are things like um, the way we experience choice, the way we experience um, determine ourselves as being able to freely choose or, or being determined and our sense of entrapment within life. Um, and the two poems I'm going to look at here are Gulliver, a very kind of obvious instance of that, and Vesper Song, which is a little bit counterintuitive to put in this category, but I'll explain when I get there how I think it fits. Um, okay, so there's the question also of subjective human experience, that is our psychological, cognitive, imaginative and emotional responses to the world in which we find ourselves. And, and, um, and these things are often found together. They're not just sort of separate categories. They're constantly intersecting with each other. The way our psychological and emotional lives run isn't sort of compartmentalised there together. And so um, Slessor is really interested in that experience. And so um, Gulliver, again, another example, Out of Time, Wild Grapes and William Street. I'm going to touch on those in relation to that. Social and historical experience. And so um, Slessor does have those in his poetry, um, but he approaches questions of history and society through that the lens of um, a kind of an existential um, lens and a subjective lens. And so, um, again, examples include Wild Grapes, William Street, Vesper Song, Beach Burial. I'll try to cover some of those. And moral experience. Okay, so he's interested in that through Vesper Song. He gives us a character's kind of moral take on the world. And I'll roll that point into another discussion I'm going to have in the lecture. So having a think about technique then. So what techniques are used by the poet to... Um, explore the question of existence. And so one of the ones that's really, really vital for looking through all of these poems is the question of voice. Now, the reason voice is, it's important in pretty much every literary text, but why it's really important in Slessor's poetry is that if we're thinking about the question of human experience, it implies that term human experience, implies some sort of shared or collective um, fundamental existential kind of experience of the world. And um, we have to sort of look at how does he, how do we see that in his poems? How does that track in the poems? And so voice is a really good way of looking at it because it invites the reader into a relationship with the text, who is speaking, how they're speaking, um, and who they're speaking to. So first of all, all the poems that we've got um, use first person. OK, but they use them quite differently. So first of all, um, we've got a lot of the poems are using what we call first uh, person singular. So they're using an I that's called a lyric voice, an I, um, except for Beach Burial. And Beach Burial's got a sneaky little use of the first person in the second last line of the poem where it alludes to an us, the idea of the soldiers, the dead, the dead sailors who may be fought with us. You know, and so there's a kind of an that the reader is introduced into this inclusive um, we, this uh, first person at the end of the text. Uh, in some cases, the use of first person is highly inclusive. Um, and so there's a kind of a universal human experience that's being evoked again out of time because it's about this universal thing, which is we all experience ourselves through time. We all age, we all, you know, um, have this element of time around us and in us all the time. Beach burial um, 
has, again, that us, that we that I just talked about. Wild Grapes uses a first person, but it's a very, um, it's a first person who doesn't provide us with identifying characteristics or unique characteristics about them. And so even though there is an I, it's this, this persona who's eating this, this grape that sends them into this kind of meditation. Um, they're not an identified eye or an idiosyncratic eye. And the same with Gulliver, even though the Gulliver's voice is a very kind of uh, distinctive voice, it's not an individually identified voice. And so they speak to, with this eye, this first person, they do speak to a kind of a universal um, experience, an inclusive experience. In some cases, this eye takes a kind of an oppositional position. By that I mean, um, I'll go to my, I'll sort of combine this with my next point, is that there's an implied, um, what we call interlocutor or addressee, there's an implied other person who is being spoken to or other perspective that's being um, addressed in the poems. And so, for instance, in Gulliver, we have this you who's being addressed. You know, if you would do this, then I could be you know, free, what have you. And so um, there's a, a kind of an implied um, other speaker. In William Street, we have the, the persona saying to us, you know, you find this ugly, I find this lovely. And so where there's this kind of implied oppositional perspective that the um, that the speaker is speaking back to. And of course, in Vesper Song, we have two implied addressees. First of all, we have the convicts um, who um, the, the, the Reverend Samuel Marsden enjoys tormenting. And then we have him directly addressing God and the poem goes into this sort of prayer mode um, later on. And so, um, their eyes, but they're also speaking to a you. And so sometimes they're quite individually identified, like with the Reverend Samuel Marsden. Other times they are more anonymous, but nevertheless using the I. And of course, um, Slessa, um, to really brilliant effect, uses the genre of the dramatic monologue. And this is a, um, a, a genre that we associate very strongly with the poet Robert Browning from the 19th century. But what we see particularly, say, in Vesper Song is this very individualised character speaking and speaking to somebody else. And so we have the dramatic, dramatic monologue. And so the use of human experience through the voice is something really worth paying attention to in these poems. Um, so I'm going to assume that when you go through them in your class and in your revision, um, you will start sort of identifying where you see those. But I'm just kind of giving that to you as a frame uh, from which to start when you're thinking about the question of human experience. So voice is always a very, very important thing to look at. So moving to my next slide, right. Oh, hang on, I need to go back. Oh, now I'm going forward and I wanna go back. And for some reason, I don't seem to be able to control what's going on with my slides, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened there. I'm gonna pull them up. Can you press like escape and try and go out of it? I can try. Or swipe forward to exit? Swipe forward? That's no. what it just says on the top there. Uh, no. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, what should I do? Always... I'm going to go out of my share screen and come yeah. back in. Okay. So I don't know why it's decided to do that. Um, in fact, yep, there it is. <sighs> okay. Uh, I'll just go to the slide I was going to talk to next and I'll come back in now with my share screen um, and see how we go. Okay, uh, back up. Sorry, now I'm trying to come into Zoom and I'll share my screen again. Hang up. And let's go, let's share. All right, so I'll get back on. On board now and talk about um, technique and existential being. Okay, so um, this is the first category. So one of the things that was really important to take note of, we've talked about voice, is to start thinking about imagery in in these particular texts. And the two that I'm and, um, I'm singling out here are out of time and beach burial because they're both really preoccupied with the effect of time and the existence of humans within time. And one of the things that that they have in common is, of course, water imagery. And both Beach Burial and Out of Time use a wave image, the idea of kind of um, time's kind of pulsing and it's kind of recursive. 
kind of um, return and something that we're kind of surrounded by. But interestingly, in Out of Time, we get two images of time. We get the image of the wave and the image of the knife. So time becomes something that surrounds us but it also is something that passes through us. And so he's really interested in this and it's quite an existential poem um, for that reason. A couple of other things I wanna to bring to your attention about Out of Time is first of all, that it uses really, I think it's a fantastic poem. I have to, I'm gonna be, uh, it's gonna be obvious. I think it's a fantastic poem, I really do. Um, it's really brilliant in its use of a cyclic structure. Okay, so it starts and ends with the same image. Okay, and this is um, the 100 yachts, the, the image of the time flowing like 100 yachts. And so the, the idea of time being not something that just flows in a straight line, but is, is something that goes in a circle and in a kind of a cyclic structure is something that the poem actually doesn't just talk about, but performs. And other sorts of um, ways in which flow, the flow of time, but also its kind of repetition is built into the poem is through the use of a technique. And I, I work on very early poetry. I work on medieval poetry and this technique is used all the time in medieval poetry. It's called concatenation. When you see a link between the end of one stanza and then that line being used as the first line, uh, so the last line of one stanza is used as the first line of the following stanza. And so you kind of have a link between them and a repetition, but also a flow. And so what we see is Slessor actually using the nuts and bolts structure of his poem to express his theme. And if you can really pay attention to the way technique reinforces theme or complicates theme, that's already going to take you to a more sophisticated response. Okay, another thing that both of the poems do, but particularly in Out of Time, is the, is the use of enjambment. So again, this is these run-on lines. Um, rather than what are called end stop lines, which end with a comma or a full stop and kind of complete the thought. Um, and jammed lines have the thought flow across the actual lines. So the lines begin to kind of tumble into each other. And for a poem that's about time, this is a really important technique, okay? So it accelerates the pace. So we don't have this kind of plotting structure, but a very fluent structure. Um, and also it presents us with a voice that has a kind of fluidity and an immediacy and a naturalism. So this is a voice that addresses us in this way that flows like conversation rather than being in kind of structured lines like a poem in an obvious way. So um, it's a really great set of techniques for producing and, and deepening the theme and performing the theme. And in Beach Burial, what we have is a really interesting vocabulary of anonymity and images of identity being erased. So again, thinking about the way time erases identity. Um, and what we also see, again, it uses, it's not as um, dramatically cyclical as, um, as um, out of time, but it starts with a set of military images and it ends, it returns to those military images. And so it, again, traces a kind of a circle in that use of imagery and that sense of people who have now, these dead bodies have kind of been taken out of the sort of flow of life and are now in this kind of cycle of time. So thinking about the way not just imagery works, but then the way the structure of the poem ties in with the imagery to produce this very densely um, woven account and exploration of time. So I bring those to your attention. So I'm gonna to move to the next um, point. And sorry, I know I'm, I'm barreling through this very quickly, but hopefully you can then um, spend some time unpacking it with the poems in a quite detailed way. So sorry, I'll go to my next slide. Um, so technique and existential experience. So the two poems I'm going to single out here are Gulliver and Vesper Song. I find Vesper Song a little bit of an outlier amongst the poems that have been selected for the HSC, but here's how I'm going to try and tie it in a little bit with Gulliver. So both of the poems, one of the things that's very striking when you put them side by side is the way in which they use a lot of imagery of suffering, of violence and imprisonment. Okay, so that, that's what they share with one another. But one of the really interesting things about them when you put them together is the way in which they are exploring this 
um, idea of imprisonment, entrapment and suffering from opposing positions. So what I mean by that is that the protagonist or the persona of Gulliver is experiencing, is the victim of this sense of existential imprisonment, you know, that he's kind of tied to these bows and tiny, tiny little kind of ties in his life that trap him like a cage. Whereas in um, Vesper Song, of course, the Reverend Samuel Marsden is the punisher and he revels in that capacity to punish. He's a really sadistic <laughs> character. So, um, so, but they both have these kinds of this interest in the idea of human suffering. Both poems focus on the idea of suffering, but from quite different perspectives. And so um, what I want to point you to is the way in which they use some quite key um, images, very distinctive images um, that, that I suppose, show us the way these different personae respond to or participate in suffering. So first of all, in Vesper Song, we have this, again, very ingenious um, poem, and it uses this what's called a conceit, okay? So a conceit is when you have a metaphor that goes across, often can go across a whole poem, certainly goes across several lines, and it keeps being built up. And so we have this image of leather, that goes through the poem. And leather um, is this extended conceit that unites, I've got here boots and whips, but it also unites the bodies of the whipped um, prisoners. And so it's really, leather becomes this kind of image of, leather, of the boots and then the leather of the whip and the cat of nine tails, and also the skin, the vellum, uh, which is the metaphor that's um, used to describe the skin on the backs of the whipped prisoners. And so we have this image that this conceit that goes across the poem um, that's really worth unpacking because it tells us about the, the, the pleasure that this particular persona takes in um, punishment and in inflicting suffering on other humans. Um, in the case of, um, of Gulliver, we have all of these existential images of imprisonment. And in particular, this idea of the tyranny of sinews. And people will, of course, know that Gulliver comes from Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift's novel, very famous scene in which Gulliver finds himself imprisoned on a beach by all of these tiny, tiny, tiny little <laughs> um, ropes um, put over him by these uh, diminutive um, people called the Lilliputians and he finds himself unable to, to free himself even though all of these individual ropes are so tiny because together they entrap him. And so it's an image of really despairing existential entrapment. This isn't somebody in prison. This is somebody whose life has become their prison. Okay, so um, taking note of that idea of imprisonment as something that is um, produced by all of these almost invisible stresses and strains of life. Okay, what we see in Gulliver also is this metaphor is, is repeated. We have a lot of repetition in the text. That repetition is really worth paying attention to because it is about how this uh, persona expresses entrapment. This sense of something they just try and try and try to free themselves from and they just repeatedly find themselves back in this entrapped state. So take paying attention to repetition as something that elaborates the theme. Okay, it's a technique that elaborates the theme. And this kind of um, voice structure, we have these particular um, modes of address that reinforce the theme too. So we have the persona of Gulliver saying, if you, you know, if you would just give me this kind of prison, I would, you know, break down the walls. I will, and then it switches to I would, which is um, the modality changes from something that would definitely happen to something that maybe would happen. So we see him kind of losing hope through the text, through this use of this particular if, if you, I structure. So pay attention to how you see that particular um, mode of address going on. Okay, in um, Vesper Song, we have um, this, what we have is this idea of human suffering, but it's um, put through a, the kind of lens of, the, of this particular persona's moral identity and the way he regards human punishment, not just as an existential experience, but a moral experience. And so we see him throughout the poem believing that the uh, suffering that he's inflicting on others is essentially a kind of um, path to moral salvation. Of course, what we find out at the very end of the poem is he's just a total sadist and he's even saying to God, look, 
if I can't whip people in heaven, send me to hell, I'll whip them there. And that's my paraphrase, but that is essentially what he's saying. And so we have this kind of hypocrisy in that in that character. And I want to draw your attention to the um, rhyme structure of Vesper Song because it tells us about the persona. Slesser is very good at giving us, at using his rhyme schemes um, and his kind of line structures to tell us a bit about his speakers. And so what we get in um, Vesper Song is what are called end-stopped rhyming couplets. Okay, so each line rhymes with the one before it, so couplets that rhyme with each other. End-stopped means they end with a full stop or a comma, again, the thought ends. What does that tell us about this speaker? It tells us about his love of order. Okay, his love of enforcing rules brutally. So he just brutally grinds through these couplets and it tells us through the um, rhyme scheme what he's like and what his values are. So I'll just put those to you and I will move because of time <laughs> being a bit of a pressure. I'll move to the next slide. I've just got a couple more slides to get through. So the other thing, uh, the other form of experience that I mentioned in my um, first slide is the idea of subjective experience. By that, I mean that the way we experience the world is filtered through our kind of um, individual um, perceptions of it, the way it makes us think, the way it makes us feel. And of course, the way we think and feel affects the way we conceive the world. Okay, so we have all of this kind of perceptual, cognitive, emotional um, experience that's tied up in the way we, we see the world. And so if I can give you some examples in William Street. William Street is a fantastic, I, I love the poem a lot, uh, but it gives us, it's a great example of somebody of giving us the cognitive experience of walking through a space and being bombarded with impressions. So we don't get a holistic portrait of William Street, and anybody who's ever walked up William Street um, can see that this is this is a very uh, impressionistic poem rather than a, a kind of a total panoramic poem. And so we have these fragmented sensory experiences that the poem conveys to us. And these are visual, things that the persona sees, olfactory, that is things that the persona smells, and auditory, things that the persona hears. And these are all reinforced through um, fantastic use of sound patterning. And so just to, to give you an example, sorry, I've got, I've got poems scattered all around me at the moment. And so, for instance, when we get the um, sound of onions hissing, we get the, the, um, the grease that blesses onions with a hiss and that fantastic use of um, alliteration to get that sizzling of onions. And so we have um, this kind of cognitive impressionistic poem. Um, and so we have also short stanzas and half rhymes, okay, that reinforce this sense of the impressionistic and disjointed effect. So we don't get long stanzas, we get these kind of series of short blasts of imagery and sound and smell. And, um, and so that kind of, again, creates that impressionistic effect. And that use of half rhymes makes the voice a more naturalistic um, voice that isn't trying to craft what's around them, they're just trying to take it all in. Okay, of course, the poet is crafting, but the effect of non-crafted experience is what the poem is trying to convey. Okay, so we get this evaluation of his surroundings. You find this ugly, I find this lovely. And that fantastic half rhyme between ugly and lovely is the way he ties that evaluation together. Um, if I can move to Wild Grapes, it's a very different poem. Um, and what we see here is again though a, a persona who is having a sensory experience so in that respect it's like William Street but it's then absorbing and meditating on that sensory experience so rather than trying to just kind of let all the fragments kind of sit around him this persona meditates on on what they're experiencing and so they they walk into this orchard and eat this grape and it leads them into this imaginative reverie into a, a, a a lost time into this idea of historical oblivion. So who was this Isabella Great named after? Um, this lost girl who the persona imagines and kind of meditates on. And so if you're going to write a poem that's meditative, um, you've got to slow the pace down, okay? So the quickness of pace that we see in William Street is very different from the pacing that we see in um, Wild Grapes. And so what Wild Grapes does is we find a kind of quite even progression 
across its four stanzas. Okay, so they progress from the here and now into that lost past and they do it in quite even stages. And so we see a much more meditative, slowed down, even pace that reflects that kind of meditative structure. And so, and the meditative theme. And each structure also has a regular rhyme scheme. So it has an AABCA rhyme scheme. Again, it takes us, gives us a persona who is much more meditative, who's thinking through and thinking on what it is they're experiencing. Now I can see I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna to jump to my final slide and I'm gonna let you unpack all of this later yourselves. And so these poems, I've talked about that they, that they engage in um, existential reflection, but that doesn't mean that our persona uh, persona in his poems never experience themselves in terms of the social or the historical. Um, so what it just means is that they that Slessor uses the, the existential and the subjective to think about these questions. So for instance, in William Street, there is a very clear portrait of poverty, of an urban environment in which we have precarious figures. You know, we get these images of pawn shops where people have had to hock their trousers. You know, we've got prostitutes and dips, which are kind of, you know, alcoholics. And so we have these precarious figures. Um, but it's not a poem that foregrounds social commentary. It just gives us a portrait of how in that urban environment these lives are led. And so there's an acknowledgement of the social, but it's done through the subjective. So we see that, the, the, you know, they're not kind of predominantly social commentary poems, but it's in there. The same with Beach Burial. Okay, it's not a poem that flags itself as an anti-war poem. But nevertheless, that sense in which war obliterates identity and leaves us only with these corpses rolling, you know, roll, being brought in by the waves and then buried on the beach. And we get this one image of um, warfare, which is the sob and clubbing of the gunfire. But so it's a very subtle image of warfare, but done again through this existential meditation on loss and time and the oblivion, the oblivion of the human. Of, um, you know, by time. And so the last one that I would want to flag with you is probably the most evidently kind of social and historical is Vesper Song. And it's, it gives us a portrait of the kind of brutality of Australia's um, colonial penal system. And it's conveyed through, again, this really violent imagery <laughs> that I talked about before. Um, and also this persona who basically exposes himself at the end as a religious sadist, right? So we get this, um, again, not, we don't get uh, the poem editorialising or commenting in an obvious way about colonial violence, but it gives us a character who embodies this and who speaks from that perspective. And so he uses the subjective to get to the historical and the social. So <laughs> a little bit of a sprint there for you all, but I hope that that um, helps you and allows, gives you some starting points into then really drilling down into the poems.